Okay, so welcome everyone to FIAC's online viewing room for its second edition and the 47th edition of FIAC happening at the Palais Ephemer. Thank you so much to our great panel um, for joining in today. Um, we're going to be discussing the transatlantic relations and France America collection um, with Quentin Bajac, the director of the Jeux de Paume in Paris. Um, Clément Cheroux, uh, who is the chief curator of photography at the MoMA Museum in New York, and who's going to be also moderating this talk, and Sarah Meister, executive director of Aperture Foundation in New York as well. I'm going to hand it over to Clément for the moderation. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Victoria, thank for you. your thank introduction. You. Um, so I'm Clément Cheroux, uh, uh, and I'm here at, uh, at MoMA in New York. And I would like to say first that I'm the newcomer in the, in the team of, uh, of curators. Both Quentin and Sarah have been working on the Walter collection, uh, both in the New York exhibition and in the Paris exhibition. And I arrived at MoMA a year ago uh, when the project was already uh, completed. Uh, and so in a way I jumped in the train, uh, in a train that was already at full speed. Uh, and so this is the reason why I'm gonna uh, I propose to Quentin and Sarah to, uh, to moderate, to be the moderator, the one who is asking questions uh, during the, the full hour we are going to spend uh, together. So let's start with um, saying a few words um, about uh, uh, this, um, this exhibition in the Jeux de Paume in, uh, in Paris, uh, which is the, we should say, the culmination of a long relationship between MoMA and uh, Thomas Walter, the, the collector. Uh, there is, I would say, four dates to keep in mind. Uh, in 2001, uh, MoMA uh, purchases uh, 341 photographs from the Walter collection. Uh, Peter Galassi was the driving force uh, for that uh, purchase. In 2014, you both, uh, Quentin uh, and Sarah, um, organize uh, the exhibition of the, of the collection, plus a catalog and also a, a very important website. We're gonna talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so that was in 2014. In 2017, the MoMA uh, made another purchase of 41 uh, photographs from the Walter collection. And then in 2021, uh, an exhibition which is gathering these two uh, acquisitions um, was curated, organized by you, Quentin and Sarah, and it was shown uh, first at Massy in, in Lugano, then at the Jeux de Paume in, in Paris, and it will travel uh, to uh, Camera uh, in Torino uh, in the spring of uh, next year. Um, so the, the exhibition that we're going to talk about is now on view at the, the Jeux de Paume, and it's an exhibition of 230 uh, photographs that are gathering these two uh, acquisitions. And maybe let's start with um, a question to Sarah. Um, uh, Sarah, can you tell us uh, if the two shows, the one that was uh, in, in New York in, in 2017 and the one which is now in Paris are the same or very different? How is the, uh, what, what is the relation between these two shows? Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, the, the shows have at their heart many of the same photographs. So uh, it's no surprise that Quentin and I, we had, you know, we enjoyed so much working with these uh, pictures to come up with the structure and the installation at MoMA. And I think if you go forward, Quentin, we'll see. Um, so this is an example of one of the installation views at MoMA in 2014. Um, so there are several things that are the same. One is that the vast majority of the pictures that we loved the most, that we wanted to have in both exhibitions are there. So at heart, these are uh, many of the same photos. And the structure is the same in that in New York and now in Paris, there are both in-depth considerations of particular figures and looks at thematic groupings that we came up with. But this picture, this installation view illustrates, so that, sorry, if you go back one yeah. more, uh, Quentin, yeah. sorry. Um, the, the, the blue walls, those teal colored walls, those were one way in which we 
that was how we signaled in New York that it was the work of a single photographer and each gallery had an in-depth consideration like that. But the biggest difference I would say, there are two main differences between the show in New York and what's now in Europe. Um, one, if you go to the next slide, is that the these were on view in the collection galleries at MoMA. And what that meant was that we were able to integrate um, here sculptures by Maholi Naj and Rodchenko, um, films from MoMA's collection, some drawings and other works on paper. So it was looking at this collection in the context of MoMA's collection um, and specifically works in other media. So that was one difference of how uh, it looked in New York. If you go to the next one, you'll see a film kind of out of the corner of your eye there on the far left. Um, and another one of the uh, single figure walls. But the, the other thing that's quite different is that we made this major acquisition, as you mentioned in 2017. And what that has allowed us to do is to reimagine and reinvent these groupings and to bring these new photographs into it. So um, there are um, many highlights of that 2017 acquisition that the museum simply didn't own in 2014. So we couldn't have put them on the wall. So I would say those are probably the two biggest uh, differences between it, but at heart, these are the mass, you know, treasures of the museum collection. Um, we had, you know, some other display choices, although now seeing what Quentin did in Paris, uh, these look tame in comparison. <laughs> um, but the, this is a, the fourth installation view uh, from New York. That's great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, Quentin, can you can you tell us a bit more about uh, Thomas, uh, about Thomas Walter, the the, the man who uh, gather all these incredible uh, photographs over a period of many, many years. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about how he was collecting and what was he particularly interested in? So Thomas Walter is still alive. He's 75 today. That's, I think, worth mentioning. Uh, he was born in, in 49, German, born in Wuppertal. Um, He's a very discreet man, so we don't know much about, and probably maybe Sarah knows more things than I do about Thomas, but, but let's say that he had a very uh, early and interesting connection with photography. There's a very nice image of him uh, at the age of 10, taken by Florence Henry, uh, which means that uh, already at this age, he knew some photographers, and in fact, his mother was a, a kind of Le Leica addict and she was taking and recording family life and doing some photo albums. So even if he was not a young Lartig, he was into photography at a very early age. And he keeps today taking images and a lot of images. So he, he studied architecture. He tried to become a, a commercial photographer, in fact, uh, in London for a few years in the mid seventies, working mostly in advertisement uh, and, and fashion, but mostly advertisement. And then he moves to New York uh, in the second half of the 70s. And that's really at that time that he starts collecting, uh, that he gives up uh, commercial photography and that he starts, the, the first image which he bought was definitely not a modernist image. It was Dwayne Michaels, uh, Dwayne Michaels image that he bought in Berlin, in fact, in 76. And then moving to New York, he started uh, this collection around European and American modernism. Mostly, you know, uh, buying from auction houses and European, and American dealers, New York, Berlin, mostly. Um, and um, and uh, at that time also, he started in fact being closely associated with, with MoMA. And once again, you know, Saha started working when uh, Thomas was probably still a member of MoMA's photo committee. But uh, there's that long and kind of intimate story between, between Thomas and, and MoMA. And Thomas was, of course, uh, quite close to uh, uh, the two chief curators of photography at that time, John Karl Sarkovsky in the 80s, and of course, Peter Galassi that you mentioned in the, in the, in the 90s. 
So in a way, uh, when the MoMA at the very end of the 90s started analyzing its collection and realized that there were some gaps that needed to be filled, uh, especially concerning European modern photography, uh, Walter's collection was, uh, was kind of obvious because he was in the room, he was already in the room and uh, he was absolutely re ready. He had the feeling at that time that the collection was maybe nearly closed and that he could probably uh, move to something else, which he did after giving mm. and, and, and uh, selling his collection to, uh, to, to MoMA. Mm. Sarah, would you like to add something about your relationship? Sure. With, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say he, he is, I think you're, he's a very private human being. I think that's a good, but, but also his sense of, of connection to these photographs, it is, um, it, it's a palpable connection. So he's not a collector who um, looked through a textbook and said, oh, these are the names I need to have. And it's um, there's nothing rote about it. So you have a combination of, for instance, here on the right, the, the most extraordinary print of Alvin Langdon Coburn's The Octopus. Um, you know, this is an iconic image and the most unbelievable print by that image. And then next to it on that same wall, you have a work by Walter Latimer of the train station in Newark, New Jersey. And I'll say, I had never heard of Latimer. And so this is a collection that's guided by a very um, refined eye and a very um, uh, passionate heart. And it is, and each photograph and many of the photographers themselves, Thomas can talk to and about, and it's what made it so fun to, to work on this with him is because he has, he has a very natural sense of what goes with what. And I remember when Quentin and I took Thomas through this installation for the first time, you know, we were a little nervous because we knew he was very, he was very discriminating, very, you know, he knew what these pictures should look and that he was pleased with it. You know, I mean, maybe Quentin wasn't crying, but like, I think the <laughs> Thomas and I had tears in our eyes. So, um, so it, you know, I do, he's a very kind human being as well which is irrelevant to the photographs, but true. Well, that's important. Um, what, what is, can you, uh, Sarah, tell us uh, about the structure of the show? I mean, what are the different chapters uh, at the at the Jeux de Paume? Let's sure. dive into the, the, the show in itself. Um, and I think so, we have some yeah. images here again. I think, yeah, I think if we go to the next slide, we have a few um, images and I just picked a representative one. Now at MoMA, when we showed this, there were six galleries. And so um, those six galleries, um, are the guide, you know, when we, when we, you know, inst exhibition planning, of course, is a lot of practical consideration. So we started with saying, okay, um, we have six galleries, let's think of six themes that this, this collection works within. Um, and the first one of those uh, we called the modern world. So let's see what we have here. If we have a pick, oh, okay, how about this one? This one, it doesn't matter. I'll say them out of order. The, the order is truly irrelevant. Um, this, at MoMA at least, was in a, a gallery called Modern, um, The Artist's Life. And it brought together a lot of the portraits of artists, self-portraits by artists. Um, this is Lucia Maholi's portrait of Florence Henri. Um, it also brought together a, a lot of photographs that Thomas had collected of photographs um, made in the Bauhaus so that you had a real sense of how artists saw themselves, wanted to present themselves, wanted to present their peers and their networks. And at the Bauhaus in particular, how photography was integrated into the architecture of this space and in fact, into the fabric of their lives. So that was one category, artist life. Um, let's look at the next slide before I guess. Um, <laughs> okay, so this one, is from um, what we were calling mo the modern world. And this had to do with how photography was capturing motion, distance, point of view, um, aerial views, um, multiple exposures 
in per, uh, related to sport and activity and other uh, modern endeavors. The Willy Ruga photographs went into this category. Um, and so this was, a, a get, you know, a lot of the themes had to do with this engagement with modern life, modern activities, what it meant for photography um, to be engaging with these things in a new uh, in new ways. Um, and so these were two of our my particular favorites from that section. The third section, let's see, um, we call a number of different things, but um, at heart it's experiment experiments in form. And this was uh, Franz Rowe, here comes the new photographer. How can um, formal concerns express an, another aspect of modern life? How can the camera help you see things and understand the world differently? And this is photograms, multiple exposures. Um, and again, we, as I was mentioning before, the extraordinary thing about the Walter collection is that it includes, you know, names by artists like Franz Rowe, who literally wrote the book, um, and Yaroslava Hataklova, which to our, um, you know, to my eye, when we first acquired these in 2001, these were completely unfamiliar names. And we didn't have even the internet at MoMA, you know, to do the research. To, so it, um, the research really occurred over the course of, um, a course of the pictures being there. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later when we talk about the website. But anyway, this is from this section, Experiments in Form. The next section we call magic realisms, which also is its own form of experimentation, but this one is really anchored in the human form. Um, this is Edmund Kesting's uh, photograph of his son, but it's this huge print, um, sort of lightly solarized so that it becomes both familiar and disorienting and um, Again, the, the most impressive prints in the collection are sometimes iconic image uh, like this, like Max Burkhart's or um, the, the Coburn, but then sometimes like this, which is just uh, much more of a surprise. And yeah, then, Sarah, yeah. Sarah, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, sure. I would like to, um, to emphasize the fact that uh, from my point of view, this collection is really amazing because it's a mix of uh, very famous uh, icons of the history of photography, but at the same time, uh, discoveries of photographers and, 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 and photographs that have never been published before. And it's, I, I really, I personally really like this balance between these two types of uh, images. I think that's really something great. And that's really, uh, if I can also jump in, that's, yeah, really one of the, that's also one of the response we have, you know, from the show in Paris, the fact that people come to Jeux de Pomme expecting to see masterworks by well-known photographers. And of course, they find masterworks by well-known photographers, but they also find a lot of, you know, small little gems by, by photographers less well-known. And they're very, very interested in that, in that mix. That is a very dynamic yeah. one. Yeah. And this is actually a big gem. You know, this is uh, a yes, big gem. <laughs> But, but yes, the, the, and that's part of what makes the exhibition so exciting to see is that it's almost like a challenge to say, you know, even the stories that were published and written, you know, this is, this is territory with which we assume we're familiar. In other words, it's one thing that from Paris or from New York, you feel like, oh, well, we have, we understand the circles that we're working here, but the Latimer picture or this just yeah, show yeah. you that even those stories that are are more immediate um, can still be unfamiliar and surprising. So I think it's a great point. Um, the next section we called Symphony of a Great City, um, an ode to the Walter Ruttman film of the same uh, title. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs in that from the 2017 part of the acquisition. So again, this is on view in Europe for the first time. It was not in our New York um, exhibition, but it is amazing. Um, and then the last section is called uh, Haute Fidelité in Paris or Purisms was what we called it in New York. But it really is about this shift from 
pictorialism into modernism and how I'm using only the example of Edward Weston. Um, and I actually love how Quentin in your book, you put these sequenced like this with the later picture on the left and the earlier picture on the right, kind of subverting your expectation of chronology, but also helping you recognize in this uh, very ethereal, otherworldly photograph of Margaret Mather in the attic, um, the same interest in form and shape that you then end up seeing when Weston travels across the country and makes at the Armco uh, steel factory. So um, this, um, this is an example of one of the in-depth looks uh, in that section. So there are six sections and they are somewhat fungible, meaning we had it one way in New York, the catalog, um, but there are some pictures that could live in multiple sections because they all embrace and explore this question of a modern vision or the world understood through a camera. And in that um, you, could, you could imagine slightly different uh, organizations. And I think it's actually one of the things that just on our little walkthrough of your installation and in Paris content was so exciting. you seeing new juxtapositions and new combinations of this work. It was great. So that's interesting to see that in this um, last section, um, we have a few uh, American photographers. Uh, the exhibition is mainly uh, European photography, but there is a few, uh, a few examples of uh, uh, with Western and, uh, and a few others. Um, and Quentin, you just had at the Jeu de Paume, I think it was last week, a symposium, which is about the importance uh, in the history of, of photography of this relationship between uh, Europe and the, and the US. And I would love to hear from you about this question of the, of the transatlantic relationship. And I would love to uh, better understand if you think that this collection is an emblematic example of the of this of this transatlantic uh, relationship. Yeah, probably. So I just mentioned, you know, that 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 last section of the exhibition, which is high fidelity, which is in fact a dialogue between American and European photography, which is a dialogue between, on the one hand, straight photography with Stiglitz, with Western, with Strand, etc. And on the other hand, Czech photography and Czech photographers that were fully aware of what was happening in America, thanks to a few uh, Czech slash American photographers that, that, that brought camera work and some prints uh, to, um, to, to Prague in the very early 20s. So there's that, that, that dialogue uh, right from the 20s, which means that you know images circulated. They circulate through, through books, through, through magazines. And there was already that, that circulation. But yes, of course, I think it's a really good example of these transatlantic exchanges. First, the fact that, you know, there's Thomas Walter himself, who is that German born collector moving to the US and collecting from New York. So uh, doing that collection, which is about European and American photography. So collecting European photography, but within, in a way, uh, an American context and from, and from New York, which is, uh, I think, interesting. I think it's, it's also worth mentioning that at that time, you know, Walter was in close contact with some of the photographers that he collected later on. You know, some of them were still alive at that time. And he was quite close to André Kertesz, for example, but also to Ilse Bing. Uh, so photographers that in a way also had in the past that transatlantic, transatlantic experience of moving mm -hmm. from Europe uh, to the US. Um, he was also quite close to, to someone like Berenice Abbott, so in a way an American photographer, but who was, as you know, so instrumental in bringing some French photographer, especially Adjay, uh, mm -hmm. and putting Adjay on the map of the, um, the American map as a central figure. So she's really a, a central figure for that an important bridge between Paris and, uh, and New York. So yes, uh, there's really at the very heart, you know, of, of uh, Walter's philosophy of collecting that idea of exchange and transatlantic exchanges. Uh, and in a way, focusing on the 20s and 30s is a really good illustration of that, because as you know, you know, uh, photographers moved, especially in the 20s, from the US to Europe. And then in the 30s, mostly for political and economic reasons, from Europe 
of course, to, to the US. And it's also about all these photographers that were born European and that died with an American citizenship or on the American soil. So in a way, you could say it's a collection about European photography, but also about the way European photography influenced, or to take another word, influenced American photography or was part of an American history of photography in the very first half of the, of the 20th century. So I think that's interesting. Having said this, you know, today we should say that this is about North transatlantic exchange. Uh, there's mm -hmm. nothing about Africa and there's yeah. nothing about Latin America or very few examples about Latin America. There's just mm -hmm. Alvarez Bravo, for example, Mexico, a few images. There's mm -hmm. one or two great images by the Argentine Horacio Coppola, but Alvarez Bravo and Coppola, they are both really very related to a European, I would say, a background uh, and um, Coppola having spent a few months at the Bauhaus and married a German photographer. Uh, and of course, uh, Alvarez Bravo with his strong connection with the surrealism. So it's, yeah. it's true, it's a Western centric uh, view of, uh, of these transatlantic exchanges. That's super, super interesting. And I have a question which is in a way uh, related to that. Um, uh, MoMA had built its collection, Sarah say already a few words about that. And you also, Quentin, the, the MoMA really built its collection on uh, uh, straight uh, documentary style, uh, photography, uh, Strand, uh, Walker Evans, and Saladams until, I mean, we can, prolonge that until new documents, etc. And in a way, the Walter collection was a, was a way to fill a gap in the in the in the MoMA collection um, in introducing a more experimental approach to photography, which was not so much present in the collection, except Man Ray, who was uh, uh, who was present in the collection since uh, I mean very very he entered the collection very early in the in the 30s yeah I and would add more Holly also yeah I, I would add more Holly you're right yeah uh, another uh, I actually what what's so interesting is that I think all of these stories are so complicated <laughs> um yeah. and and I do it I I think to me it is absolutely true that the when I, you know I remember the acquisition meetings when Peter Galassi is making the case for why MoMA needed to acquire the Walter collection, and it was a very persuasive case that despite the fact that Beaumont Newhall had organized photography mm -hmm. 1839 1937 which did actually include a wide range of experimental and other photographs, despite the Man Ray acquisition in 1941, which had a huge number of cameraless and other photographs. The uh, Laszlo Moholy Naj major acquisition from um, Alma Reed's uh, Delphic Gallery show. So despite all of this, and there, it was still that MoMA didn't own the mm. so many of the important pieces of the story and and that this collection really helped fill that you know it was almost like we we were moma was emblematic for having championed modernist photography not just straight but actually kind of across and yet that we were missing so much and it's why you know as you've already learned it's like these pictures are in high demand by curators from all departments to be integrated into the collection displays. And so it, you know, it's what makes it painful to send them off uh, to Europe. But I think it's also interesting to, I mean, to me, it points to two other things. One is that for an artist like um, Man Ray or Ache, those were intentionally withheld from the group that MoMA acquired. So there was one early Man Ray that was included because MoMA really had nothing like it. But Thomas's other Man Rays were not a part of the acquisition. Similarly, someone like Ache, whom Thomas had collected, but that would be like bringing Coles to Newcastle. You know, we didn't need any more Ache. So, um, but it it points to also the kind of, the that acquisitions as no matter how strategic you want to be, there's an opportunistic, element of acquisitions meaning and it's something that thomas sustained over so many decades you know looking for these pictures 
many of which wouldn't have, couldn't have been on our wish list because they were East von Kearney or, you know, whatever they were, they were not our, our figures we were tracking perhaps as closely. And in fact, Horacio Coppola, who, you know, Roxana and I did the exhibition from Bauhaus to Buenos Aires of Coppola and Greta Stern's work. I had never heard Coppola's name until I saw it in the Walter collection. So I think there is an interesting, um, to me, you realize that the, the ways in which public collections are built, and MoMA is no exception to this, even with incredibly intelligent, prescient curators with opportunities, these are driven by forces um, that can be even outside of the control. So that to me, that's, it, it's true. This collection fills surprising needs, yeah. but also like all collections, it is idiosyncratic. That's, that's true. Can you tell us a bit more about the, um, these two levels of acquisition, the first acquisition and the second one? Can, can we say a few words about... Uh... I, do you want the real story? You want the truth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, because the, the, you know, the real story is that um, several, the, the core of the 20... Or 20 you want to answer this, Quentin? No, no, please, okay. please, go, please um, go ahead. Okay, the core of the 2017 acquisition actually originally came to the museum in 2001, but they were photographs that had been offered through the so-called Helene Anderson sale. And as a result, at that time, because their provenance was being questioned, uh, we did not pursue those photographs from mm -hmm. Thomas's collection. Mm -hmm. So we just took that chunk out and <laughs> set it aside. And, you know, everyone was very patient as all of these yeah. things worked themselves out the way they needed to. And, and it, it is true also in 2017, there were other non-Anderson collection uh, yeah. photographs that we acquired because it, there were just Thomas, you know, he couldn't help himself. He, he continued to acquire uh, great things. And so, um, but, the, but the real sort of not that glamorous practical reason is mm -hmm. that in 2001, if the Helene Anderson collection hadn't been um, an issue, many of those pictures would have come in in 2001. It's amazing to see that uh, in, in almost all of your answer, it's amazing to see how much the history of photography is into a kind of uh, progress. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an, I mean, there is a constant evolution of the way we are um, thinking the history of photography in terms of countries, in terms of icons, in terms of where is the research at the moment? And I, I, I like the fact that uh, this collection is a kind of living organism that is, uh, that is changing and, and evolving. And, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful story with, with, all this, uh, with all this evolution of the, of, the, of the collection in itself. And I think that's the most important lesson to draw from it is that yeah. like things that, you know, even at MoMA, which seems, you know, now looking at it from the outside, everything seems so official, but you realize that yeah. it, it's very, it's dynamic and changing and yeah. subject to this, to both human th elements and yeah. accidents yeah. and, you know, chance as um, yeah. you know, our colleague Quentin would like to, has reminded <laughs> us. Uh, Quentin, um, the, the, the presentation, the design of the exhibition in Paris is uh, quite different from the one in uh, in New York. Um, can you can you tell us a bit about this uh, amazing uh, design of, of of the exhibition in Paris? Yeah, I can tell you a few things, and probably what is more important, show you a few images. Yes, we had done that great show with Sarah at MoMA in 2014 but that was already seven years ago and I didn't want to repeat myself. So uh, I thought it was uh, time to try something else, knowing that, uh, so I worked in the, for, on the scenography in Paris with, uh, with a, an exhibition designer whose name is Pauline Felouza, who often works with the, with the Pompidou. So here are a few installation shots 
uh, in Paris, you see here first the entrance uh, and with the large wall on the right with all the names of the over 100 photographers that are represented in the show and in the background, uh, the big enlargement of a wonderful, wonderful image by, by Kate Steinitz and then some views of the galleries. So uh, Sarah already uh, explained to you the structure of the show, which remains the same in Paris. So even if there are some different images, some images that were removed and some that were added, the general structure remains the same. The general organization uh, has not changed, even if the order uh, of the sections have uh, changed from, um, from MoMA. So two things that uh, radically change uh, are first, as you see in that, uh, on that image, the structure of the added walls uh, that you see here in the middle of the gallery, uh, and that we con concede with, with Pauline Felusa as a kind of echo of or a tribute to some of the big uh, photo exhibition of the 20s and early 30s, uh, especially film on photo uh, of 1929, where, where you had this kind of rather light structures between the sections with these added walls that were not going directly completely to the, to the floor, um, that were more kind of partitions than, than real walls. And uh, I really wanted that. So we, we, I, I proposed to, 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 to Pauline Falusa a mood board with some shots of installations of the 20s. And from, um, and from this, she designed these, uh, these, these structures that are open. And so it was about not recreating galleries within galleries, not, re not recreating rooms uh, within rooms. And it was really easy to play with them as they are, as you see, modular structure. So uh, uh, you could really work and find the right proportions, the right balance for each of the several galleries. And I'm showing another uh, view here of the same uh, first gallery. And the second element, as you see, uh, are the colors, uh, bright blue, bright red, bright yellow. Um, which is also in a way a tribute to the colors of modernism. You know, we, we wanted to go against the idea that modernism is only about the white cube. It can be, but it's not only about the white cube. And that's some, as you know, some of the most well-known figures, especially of that period of early modernism, uh, were really fond of colors and using a lot of colors from, of course, the style. And this is, of course, an indirect uh, tribute to, to Mondrian's uh, colors, but also constructivism, Le Corbusier, uh, and many others, Bauhaus, of course, uh, were all about color and about color as a way to design space, which is really important. So yes, the red, the blue, the yellow, um, that gives also a kind, I think, of dynamism to the, to the room, and that gives a kind of rhythm. And then from time to time, something we also added, as you see here uh, on this uh, image, this kind of, I think you have it also here. Yes, uh, at the back, blue one. Um, this uh, kind of colored squares on the wall uh, to highlight either one photographer, one specific photographer, or one especially important series. Uh, it is something that we had already done uh, with Sarah at MoMA uh, in 2014 in a slightly different way. Um, here we did it, you know, sometimes in one wall, sometimes here uh, in the corner uh, on two walls. Uh, and once again, it was about giving rhythm and giving a kind of dynamic structure to the show because as you know, you know, as well as I do, that it's sometimes difficult when you have uh, 18, 20 meter wall and 15 to 16 small images to give rhythm. So it's true that I think adding these colors from time to time helped us to enhance uh, the black and white and the, of, the, of, the, of the prints. So uh, yes, these were in fact uh, two or three of the um, small differences, small and big differences that you find between, uh, between uh, MoMA's scenography of 2014 and the, the jeu de pomme scenography, and also the fact that Sarah already mentioned that, that in 2014, it was about MoMA's, uh, Walter's collection, entering MoMA's collection, and about that dialogue between the photos and some objects and some works uh, that were borrowed from other departments of the museum, which is something, of course, that you don't have here because you have only, I should say, uh, the 240 prints coming from, uh, from Walter. 
that's super super exciting and i really look forward to to see the show but on the on the photographs it really looks uh beautiful i mean uh it remind me a lot of the um, rochenko uh workers clubs or uh some yeah. of the uh, some of those, yeah yeah uh, exhibitions or all these yeah. all these things so that's that really works very well um i was wondering if uh you use some wallpaper uh with big enlargement of some of the photograph or is that something that you because when i'm thinking about these uh exhibition from the 20s and the 30s i'm, I'm also thinking about these uh enlargements uh and and i was wondering if that's something that you use or on the contrary you decide to um, on the avoid. on the contrary, I decided to avoid this. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we did it at the very entrance of the show with that big Kate Stein yeah. enlargement. But otherwise, initially, we had thought that we could do this. And in fact, we had plans and floor plans, especially with big enlargements. And then I decided to remove everything and to keep just, you know, just the prints, just the prints and uh, just the prints and the and the frames. Uh, mm. deciding not to add anything, no documentation, no documents, no magazines, no books that would yeah. have been borrowed from other collectors. But really, I wanted in a kind of old fashioned way, but but that's uh, uh, to, to, to have the visitor okay, focusing so. on on each of yeah. the prints and the print as uh, as objects. Uh -huh. So that leads me to my to my next question to to Sarah. Sarah, you are the new executive director of the of the Aperture Foundation. Uh, who is the leading publisher of, of photo books in the in the in the US? Uh, who is also publishing a, a magazine, which is uh, uh, such uh, an important uh, part of the of the history of, of photography. And you wrote about photo books and magazines about uh, printing uh, printed matters uh, in the catalog of the exhibition. Can you tell us a bit about this importance of photo books and magazines um, for most of the photographers in, in the exhibition? Sure. Um, you know, it was one thing we, when Quentin and I did the exhibition in 2014, at that moment, the, the essay, you know, are we con Quentin contributed a text about film. I contributed a few short entries about specific objects, but really, um, I hadn't tried to like write about the collection as a whole. And when we contemplated sending the collection to Europe, we looked, and this was when Quentin was still at MoMA, we looked at each other and we're like, yeah, we gotta say something about it. And, and then Quentin became the director of the Jeux de Pomme. And so then I was left by myself thinking, how am I going to write about this collection? And it, um, as, as he described, the idea of these collection of these photographs returning to Europe was a, was sort of a generative one that connected to this idea of a transatlantic exchange of people, of ideas, of magazines and books, and even of exhibitions that really um, nurtured the kind of fertile the fertility of this moment. And so, while I, act, I I love the the purity and the the daring really of this display with no books and no magazines. Um, in some ways, it also honors um, a core part of the research that happened in advance of the 2014 acquisition uh, exhibition, which was our colleagues Maria Morris Hamburg and Mitra Abbaspor and Leanne Daphner, who put in years of work with the support of the Mellon Foundation to think about these photographs as objects. And when you think about them as objects, the, you think about where they move, you know, where they lived, what lives they've lived, where they've been shown. And, and then you also remember that where they were reproduced is a part of those lives. So the books in which they were uh, gathered, the magazines in which they circulated became the point uh, of my essay. And of course I did all this, not even thinking that I would be working at Aperture by the time um, these photographs went on view, but somehow it, it does seem, it seems like a sort of destiny that I, um, had been making this journey for myself from thinking about these photographs as objects led by the research of Leanne and Mitra and Maria, and then into 
thinking about their circulation and and remembering that actually originally that was I mean well there were exhibitions in which they traveled back and forth but much more frequently it was the people who traveled or the magazines or the books and this was how this became such an incredibly important moment in the history of photography so um it is it's rather poignant thinking about it all uh now that's that's and then but, and i should say is is gallery uh 510 still on view the yeah Okay. Yeah. Because well, the other the the other thing is that Phil Taylor and I worked on a display in the collection galleries at MoMA that really well that has very few Walter pictures in it because of this show, but that digs into that idea of how the books and the magazines were in many instances the primary mode of circulation yeah. for these pictures or a and primary. That's, that's something which is very important. We are always trying to um, to to show some photo books and, and magazines at, at, at MoMA. Uh, and there are, I mean, almost uh, 15, 20 uh, magazines and books that are uh, on view in the in the rooms, uh, in the galleries of the museum next to the paintings and sculpture. And this is something we really try to, to keep in mind when we are doing an, an installation of the collection that the the books and the magazines were uh, a very important uh, vehicle uh, to to um, to disseminate uh, uh, photography. So that's something important. Right. Uh, and sorry, can I just say one more thing? Yeah, it yeah, is please. interesting, like in the digital era now, when everything translates from your phone to your computer screen, it's so easy to lose sight of both of these yeah. things, both the original yeah. mode of circulation and the photograph as an object with the materiality and a scale and a presence. And so it's, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that I think is so refreshing and even radical about this installation is its returned insistence on, on yeah. this object that can't be substituted for any, you know, even another print from the same negative is yeah. a different thing. Yeah. And Conta on your, on your, Side, you devoted uh, an essay in the catalog to films. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the relationship between the photographers that are in the show and the uh, and the film uh, during that that period, or the importance of the film during that period? It's as it is, as you know, a, a very long story. <laughs> it's a very complex and rich history. Uh, well, you know that both were seen by the avant-garde circles of that time as really the two mediums that were most suited to record and reflect uh, the spirit of the times. Um, far better, you know, than the classic uh, representational means, far better than painting, far better than sculpture, etc. Uh, but I think it's important to, to also underline the fact that when you look at all these avant-garde artists that started uh, being active, let's say in the 20s, they were born for most of them in the very late 19th century and the very early 20th century, that is in the 1890s and early 20th century. So in a way they were born with film and cinema. They never knew a kind of pre-cinematic world uh, and they were born and raised. Uh, and for them, for the cinema and film was something quite obvious and quite, and quite natural. So of course this, I would say, uh, entangling of techniques, cinema and photography is obvious in many exhibitions of the time. You know, I was mentioning FIFO, film own photo uh, in 29. There were also Kifot, which was another exhibition in 25, more industrial and commercial than artistic, but that was also about film and photography. Uh, and so there was, especially at FIFO, if you have a look at the Soviet section, you know, there were of course photo prints, but there were also some films that you could view uh, in small viewfinders. So there was already at that time that kind of migration of film uh, to the exhibition space, which everyone is talking today about, but that was already here uh, from, the, from, the, from the 20s. And yet I, would, I have the feeling that they were not seen already at that time on an equal footing, that there was already at that time the idea that photography was under the influence of film. You know, there are many critics that say that uh, in a way, photography has gone from one influence to another that has uh, fled from the influence of painting uh, with the end of pictorialism, just uh, to enter 
into a new uh, kind of being under influence, but under the thematic model, which is in a way true. I think that the thematic paradigm was of course very present. And if you look at, uh, especially, uh, I have the feeling that a lot of avant-garde photographers rediscovered their technique uh, through cinema, uh, through uh, distortions, through uh, fondu enchaîné. I don't know how you say that in English, uh, through uh, close-ups, of course, et cetera, et cetera. And I think so it's through cinema that they kind of rediscovered their own language and that they, uh, that they, uh, their own language that was trans adopted and transformed by, by uh, filmmakers and, uh, and cinematographers. This is also why, as you know, we, we see so many movements between you know, photographers going to film from uh, Cartier-Bresson to Paul Strong, from Man Ray to Moholy, just to mention a few that are included in the show and that you see also uh, close collaboration between filmmakers and photographers, you know, cool and events, of course, uh, Rochenko and Ziga Vertov, uh, yeah. uh, Panve yeah. and, and, and Lothar, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, of course, but we could, uh, we could talk uh, hours about that. Yeah, now that's very interesting because we've talked about books in relation to photography, about film. Um, and so uh, the question of interdisciplinarity is, uh, is there. Uh, and in 2014, the exhibition and the book at, at MoMA uh, were launched with a website, which is called uh, Object Photo, uh, which is really an amazing resource uh, for everybody who is interested in that uh, period. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us a bit more about the goals uh, of, this, of this website? How the idea came up of uh, having a website that will in a way, support or extend the exhibition. Sure. The you know the the website and it is an unbelievable resource. I turn to it all the time. You know, I just so do I. So do I. MoMA yes. object yeah. photo, and um, even though it hasn't been updated since 2014, since it launched, you know, it it really is still in, in its original form, but it it both maps the relationships between artists. It provides an extraordinary amount of uh, primary research around these photographs, where they were first circulated, what exhibitions they were a part of, um, the networks of artists that are alluded to in that opening wall that Quentin showed us. Um, and this was really Mitra Abbaspor, Leanne Daphner, and Maria Morris Hamburg with the support of the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And what it does also that is you have to dig in, it, it provides quantifiable material mm -hmm. analysis of mm -hmm. each photograph so that let's say you were ever in, you know, you were interested in acquiring or understanding the difference between this Stieglitz and another print of the, from the same negative at the National Gallery. Um, it, it photographs everything through not just regular light, but specular or raking light and allows you to understand the kind of tactility of the papers, the choices that these photographers were making, some aesthetic choices, some practical led by economic circumstances or other considerations. So um, the website really is um, an incredible uh, resource and encapsulates all, you know, many, many years of work and also has a number of new, what were then newly commissioned essays mm -hmm. about all of these things, making connections, um, you know, many of the, of our peers of our, you know, the thought leaders in the field contributed to um, that website. So yeah, it's worth, it's worth a deep dive. Yeah, I, I would encourage uh, anybody who is listening to this, um, uh, to this discussion to have a look at uh, object. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Photo. Yeah. Uh, Quentin, in, in 2011, we uh, we worked together at the Pompidou uh, to acquire the uh, Boucre collection, yeah. uh, which is a collection of uh, 7,000 um, prints from the 20s and the 30s. Um, and I would love to hear from you um, what is, from your point of view, the, the differences between these two major collectors and collections. Um, 
uh, what does that say about uh, the collecting practices in in institution both in Europe and in the in the US? Well, uh, I know that you could also answer that question because as you were saying we were both instrumental in bringing the book high collection to the Pompidou as we were both working together. Uh, there already 10, 10 years ago. But yeah, so Christian Boucret was a French collector so for people who, who listen to us. Um, and what is interesting is that, it, is that he is exactly of the same generation of, as, as Walter, you know. Uh, Boucret was born in 1950, even if he died at an early age in 2013. Uh, he's of the same generation as, uh, as, as Walter and the, the two men uh, knew, knew each other. They, of course, share that really, real interest in, in uh, modernism, even if uh, Christian Boucret was more focused on, I would say, uh, the Parisian scene and the yeah. avant-garde circle of the 20s uh, and 30s. But having said this, yeah, it's true. They collected in a very different way on the same, nearly the same topic. They collected in very different directions. And what I think is really interesting to, to note is that Thomas Walter collected carefully selecting some prints in pristine condition, uh, not that many because you know at the end of the collection there were 500 items maybe in it, whereas Christian Boucret really decided to collect large holdings, even archival material. Uh, Walter collected directly from dealers and at auction, whereas the Boucret would go often to the photographers themselves or to the estate to buy directly from uh, from from them um, and buying all sorts of, of things you know of course great exhibition prints sometimes but also contact prints press prints negatives etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are two of course very different philosophies of collecting and i should add that boucret contrary to to walter uh, was not just a collector. You know, he was also a photo historian, so he was in fact studying his collection, uh, doing books, uh, doing exhibitions from his collection, which is of course a very different approach from, from Thomas Walter, who just lived with his collection uh, and, uh, and decided that it was not his job to, do, to, to, do the, to, to study the collection and that the, the institutions should, should do it. And the fact that the two collections went for Walter to MoMA and for the other Boucret to the Pompidou is, I think, also a good example of the way, you know, the two institutions and maybe two countries collect, you know, the fact that, of course, it was, I think, totally in line, uh, that kind of mm, mm, small collections of uh, gems of in pristine condition was totally in line with MoMA's collecting philosophy that focused on the masterworks, the image that is meant to be seen on the wall, uh, and which is in fact the, 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 the final accomplishment uh, of, the, of the photographic work. Whereas, as you probably know, at the Pompidou, they have very large holdings, archival material with negatives, with contact prints, Man Ray, Brancusi, Dora Mar, Brassai, etc. Um, so it's a very different uh, collecting strategy, MoMA focusing on what I would call the aesthetic and the Pompidou focusing on what I would call the didactic, you know, being able mm -hmm. to show all the different steps of the photographic process from the negative to the print on the wall or to the print uh, in the magazine or in the book. So I think you, you find this. And uh, I think one of the best example, and you know this much better than I do, Clément, is the Man Ray collection. The Man mm -hmm. Ray collections. At MoMA, you yeah. have 150 extraordinary, exquisite mm -hmm. prints that for most of them entered at a very early uh, stage in yeah. 1941 uh, with a great provenance. At the Pompidou, you have also great exhibition prints, but also a lot, a lot of contact prints, yeah. all the negatives yeah. that entered in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. So two very, very different collections. Yeah, putting together the two collections will make it extraordinary. <laughs> 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 That's a good idea. We should, That's we the should ultimate think dream. That. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Uh, we are at the end of our discussion, and I really wanted to to thank you for your great answers. Uh, that was very nice to have this discussion with you uh, today. I would like to encourage uh, uh, all the people that are listening to us to to go to see the show uh, at the yeah. At the please Jeux come. Club. <laughs> nope, and, I'm ca uh, I can't wait to come. I'm coming in November. Yeah, me uh, but too. thank and you, Clement, for your excellent questions too. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Clement. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you That's to Fiac for organizing later. this. Thank you, Fiac. Thank you so much. And please, uh, if you, I mean, uh, 
also go to the exhibition, but also explore the, the website. Yes, don't uh, forget to explore uh, the website. Photo yeah. object, which is really a great one. So thank and, you so much. And to, and, go to, and to go to MoMA when you're in New York. <laughs> and to Apetra also. <laughs> great. Bye-bye, <laughs> so everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Clement. Bye.